Uh, my name is Ariel Pallet. I am the executive director for the Office of Nightlife at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. I'm joined by my deputy director, Jose Sogard, who will be uh, taking questions from the Q&A. Um, I just want to thank everyone so much for joining us today. Um, as New York is finally emerging from this collective trauma we've all been in through the COVID pandemic. And as we are starting to get back to life and get to back to work, um, this is a presentation of our very first comprehensive report and is really a detailed record. Um, for anyone who is actually interested in how this office was created, the initiatives and programs that we developed, um, how we navigated the pandemic, as well as how we developed recommendations for the future to help stabilize and elevate the nightlife industry um, and community. Uh, this is also really meant to serve as a roadmap for others and advocates um, who really love and support this essential industry around the city and around the world. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to give this presentation and I'll take some questions at the end. And again, please know that this will be recorded. Um, before I also get started, I just wanted to thank our small but mighty team nightlife. Again, my deputy director, Jose Sogard, uh, Francesca Mira, and Kevin Borgia, uh, who this all of this work really over the past three years have would not have been possible without them, as well as uh, all of the members um, at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, the agency in which this office resides. Um, this office was created by us <laughs> and uh, not outsourced. So please know that this was really created with a lot of love for all of you to really document this journey of the first ever Office of Nightlife uh, in New York City. So, um, and also I guess I really wanna thank everyone in the industry and part of the nightlife movement who've been devoted to the art of hospitality and the magic of life at night. Um, those who live it understand how special it is and this is really for you and also by you. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Office of Nightlife was created as a dedicated liaison and a central point of contact within the Mayor's Office of New York to serve um, as a central point of contact between the nightlife industry and city agencies for the first time ever in history. But how did we get here? So. Amsterdam was really the first to create an official nightlife mayor in Mirik Milan, and that position was created nearly two decades ago. This position is what started the movement and spread around the world where there's over 50 offices of nightlife around the world now. It was helped along nationally through the work of RHI, the Responsible Hospitality Institute, and the conversation um, and advocacy really came to New York um, through the work of the New York Nightlife Association, which many of you may not know became the New York Hospitality Alliance, and with the partnering work through the New York Artist Coalition and several other community organizations, grassroots efforts that came together to repeal the antiquated and problematic cabaret law which prevented dancing in New York City without a permit for many years. It was this movement uh, that um, provided the work, or actually that proved that there was a lot more work left to be done to help support the nightlife industry and community and resulted ultimately in the legislation written by council member Rafael Espinal, who you see here, and signed by the mayor uh, de Blasio in 2017 that created the Office of Nightlife. 
After my appointment in March of 2018, we and this small team went straight to work to set up this new office, laying the foundation, establishing the infrastructure and the trajectory for this new office. The first thing we really needed to do was to hear from you and everyone across the nightlife ecosystem, owners, workers, performers, patrons, and residents to help establish the priorities of this office. Uh, it's a vast industry, vast issues. How could we bring it all down and focus into some top priorities and get to work? So as you'll see in this past photo, we hosted five borough, a five borough listening tour to get broad feedback from everyone. And then we moved into focus groups to help dive deep into the details of those key issues. We conducted a comprehensive economic impact study of New York's nightlife, which showed pre-pandemic that this was a $35.1 billion industry that supported 300,000 jobs, over 25,000 establishments, and generated over 700 million in tax revenue to support the city at large. And you have all helped us shape and develop what ultimately became the Office of Nightlife Agenda with four focus groups. The first was to and is to support business development and now recovery. The second is to improve quality of life issues and community relationships. The third bucket is to promote safety and equity and harm reduction. And fourth is to elevate and preserve nightlife culture. So this is how we began implementing that agenda with new programs to support these priorities. First, we started with a MASH approach that we developed, which stands for multi-agency support for hospitality. This picture you see is us meeting every six weeks uh, with our city and state partners um, within the administration, um, which also really was born out of the Five Borough Listening Tour. We invited the city and state to listen with us, and we continued that conversation for the past three years, regular conversation on how to identify systemic problems and finding creative solutions to those systemic problems that we've known historically, but also how we can better help through these interagency partnerships to help better serve individual cases and issues with our casework um, by helping nightlife businesses and workers navigate city agencies and bureaucracy. Uh, through this partnership um, with our interagency working group, this multi-agency approach, approach emphasizes support and education into compliance um, over enforcement. So reinforcement before enforcement becomes necessary. Additionally, through legislation, the Office of Nightlife was tasked to produce a report on March operations. Many of you who may own venues understand that March operation stands for, unlike MASH, a multi-agency response to community hotspots, which for many in the industry have, ex um, have experienced and have questioned how and why and who they were happening to. So because of these questions and due to the multi-agency nature of these operations, they have not historically had a centralized reporting um, report to answer these questions for us. So that legislation tapped our office to produce the very first ever report of March operations, which are due biannually. Due to the pandemic, March operations were paused, so there's only been enough data to produce one report so far. But assuming that March operations will resume, there will be future reports that we will produce for evaluation of March operations. 
Another program we created was called MEND NYC, which is a free mediation program. It stands for Mediating Establishment Neighborhood Disputes with our partners at OATH, which stands for the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. You might know them as where you go to dispute your tickets with city agencies, but what you might not know is that they also have a Center for Creative Conflict Resolution. And with the new uh, commissioner, Joni Kletter, we created a partnership to help establish citywide free mediation services to help venues and their neighbors resolve disputes through communication and compromise when possible, knowing that most um, enforcement is complaint driven. Um, we felt it was really important to introduce a new and creative solution to help resolve these issues without going immediately into an anonymous um, automated call system and to help to humanize the relationship between neighbors and venues and um, hopefully create lasting improvement and relationships. Also part of our quality of life um, initiative is or was pre-pandemic, our Lower East Side Quality of Life Improvement Plan, which is really looking at city agencies and services and coordinating and aligning them to address the issues unique to life at night and to help bring cleaner, quieter, um, more managed streets in high density nightlife corridors. So, we know that much of these efforts that were made pre-pandemic are being challenged now, post-pandemic. And I will be speaking about a new initiative that we've developed to help address, address this later in the presentation. But what you'll see on the screen now is at the time of that improvement plan, we launched the Night Owl campaign, which offers nightlife words of wisdom to, for patron etiquette. Uh, very often the venues shoulder all of the responsibility and liability for quality of life issues. And we really think that patrons need to be educated about their role in this equation. And so uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, next week you'll be seeing the uh, Night Owl Outdoor Etiquette 101 um, campaign being relaunched uh, in bus shelters and subways and links kiosks to let patrons know it's okay to use your inside voice outside and other nightlife words of wisdom uh, to help shoulder the burden on quality of life in um, this summer of celebration in our return to uh, life at night. So moving forward, um, we also have our bucket regarding harm reduction. And that work has included in the past working with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to help launch public awareness, uh, public awareness campaign about the risks posed by the presence of fentanyl in other substances. Many of you may or may not know that New York is facing a very big problem with fentanyl in the drug supply and people are dying. And so historically there might have been a enforcement only approach, but now the city with our work with the Department of Health is taking a harm reduction approach and also working on prevention measures. So the naloxone or Narcan campaign, uh, it educates nightlife operators and workers that there is a free standing prescription available in city pharmacies that provide uh, Narcan, which is an overdose prevention nasal spray, as well as training that you can have behind the bar, just like a CPR kit. And um, I think it's really great progress, especially within the work of the Department of Health in the city to take this harm reduction approach. In addition, we um, hosted several panels and workshops 
uh, regarding um, harm reduction and inclusion and safety. Um, one of which you may have joined pre-pandemic, which was the state of the LGBTQ nightlife scene hosted by Michael Musto and Kevin Aviance was there and uh, Ty Sunderland and really great representatives of the industry and the LGBTQ. We also hosted several active shooter training programs because if we remember pre-pandemic, this was really a top priority for the industry. And then overnight, everything changed and the world came to a full stop. And like that, and like all of you, we had to shift into a full-time crisis management mode and to serve as a dedicated and vital connection to the nightlife community for information and guidance, as well as representation throughout the pandemic. I, for one, am, am extremely grateful that the Office of Nightlife was created before this happened to make sure that this industry had dedicated representation and to make sure that their needs were being served and met as best as was possible as we were navigating this situation. The first thing we did within the first week or two was to conduct a response survey um, that evaluated the pandemic's immediate impact. Over 12,000 respondents um, took the survey and gave us a snapshot of this devastating impact on the businesses, workers, and freelancers, showing that nearly everyone in the industry lost up to 95% of their income overnight. In addition to the survey, we held over 10 virtual town calls, bringing our city agency partners, as well as the state and federal officials to inform the nightlife industry on these ever-changing regulations and resources and how to pivot on a daily, sometimes minute-to-minute -minute basis as things were changing. Um, and not only to provide information, but to provide you the opportunity to answer questions to these agencies directly. We created resources and campaigns along with our partners at the food and beverage team at the Small Business Services Office to help explain these new rules and regulations in plain language. We included FAQs on restaurant and bar reopening toolkits, what to expect when you're being um, when you're being inspected, which is still being updated and activated and active today, um, as well as creating the it's up to you New York socialize responsibly campaign and take out don't hang out when you were able to take out drinks and food, but you weren't allowed to stand there. And we knew how challenging that was uh, for the industry to manage and hoped that these posters would help support you in communicating that to patrons. In addition, City Hall has held daily and multiple interagency business recovery calls and efforts. And this office has ensured that the nightlife industry has had a seat at that table every day to represent the industry, as we also helped City Hall to stand up emergency programs and initiatives such as the lifeline, really, that became open restaurants for outdoor seating, which is now in the process of becoming a permanent fixture to create a new cafe culture in New York City. We helped to create the Curtains Up application, um, free application assistance for one-on-one -on -one guidance for the federal grant application relief, and also helped to develop the open culture um, program for outdoor performances and to help promote it. So, this is some of the uh, uh, initiatives and, and programs and efforts throughout the pandemic, but now it's important to look forward. 
And so from action to projection is what it's called in the in the report. And I will take you now through some of the highlights of the recommendations we've developed across our four focus groups to help stabilize and secure the future of this industry, um, including creative solutions to some of the longstanding challenges that existed well before the pandemic, but are even more urgent now. And they are the result of our research, stakeholder engagement, and lessons learned throughout our casework. There are roughly two dozen recommendations in the full report, which I may not have mentioned, but you can read the full report and download it at nyc.gov slash nightlife. It's 160 pages. And this report is, uh, this presentation is really a summary, but for those of you who really are interested in the details, um, you can and should download it um, on our website. Um, so again, there's over two dozen recommendations and I'll just take you through some of the highlights um, in each section right now. So back to our, um, to our four buckets, beginning with supporting business development and recovery. We offer several recommendations to improve the business environment for existing and prospective nightlife operators. Early on, we recommended a one-stop shop. Uh, those in the industry know that it has historically been very challenging to get all of the permits and licenses you need to open a new venue and to keep it open. So we recommended streamlining these processes through a new approach with a single point of contact for permitting, inspections, as well as support. And as luck would have it, this morning, this very morning, uh, Mayor de Blasio announced the New York City Business Quick Start program, which will provide small businesses a single point of contact to navigate city regulations, as well as creating a public dashboard. The program guarantees a 48 hour response to all small business inquiries and will cut processing time by 50% for over 50,000 businesses in New York City, including nightlife and hospitality. So you can learn more about that. Again, it was only just announced this morning and we were proud to have recommended it long ago. We also recommend new protocols for quality of life complaints. Again, we know that enforcement is often complaint driven and that repeated complaints don't always reflect the real conditions or even provide venue operators with the details of the complaints in order to help make meaningful changes. Again, automated anonymous call systems are not really always conducive to longstanding success and developing improved conditions and better relationships with the, com with the community. So in addition to our MEND NYC program, we are now recommending working with enforcement agencies to establish new protocols for handling complaints, including um, referrals to the MEND NYC program as part of complaint protocol. In addition of supporting business development and recovery, we also recommend expanding cure periods. Fines for minor violations can add up to big penalties, even if the businesses are very quickly and easily able to correct the issue. So we, we recommend um, expanding cure periods for issues that don't pose immediate life safety hazards and to give businesses the opportunity to get into compliance without fines. There is actually currently legislation pending at City Council that incorporates this approach. In regards to continued improvement of quality of life issues, we have several recommendations to improve the relationships between nightlife venues and their communities, but also to help businesses manage sound and crowds, which we know is a burden that lands squarely on their shoulders. First, um, you'll see in the report 
that we recommend street hosts. Uh, this is a model that I discovered on a trip to the red light district in Amsterdam, where anything goes and people from all around the world come to celebrate there in all different kinds of ways. And so I saw an existing model where even in the most extreme dense nightlife area where quality of life issues arise, where there's a mixed use of business and red, where there's businesses and residents coexist, there can be some non-enforcement crowd management solutions. Um, this is even more challenging now as our social lives have moved um, outdoors during the pandemic. But pre-pandemic, we recommended introducing, again, non-enforcement hosts, civilians in busy areas with marked jackets to help with crowd management, to educate patrons about their responsibilities and their ability to help reduce the qualities of life impacts by keeping their voices down and by again, helping to so support the businesses and community by behaving appropriately, but also being educated and supported through this hosting program. And I'm also extremely very happy to say that this is actually happening now across the city. Our new host program um, has been piloted uh, for a few weeks and you will start to see in parts of the city and as part of the city clean core, uh, these new hosts in high traffic hospitality corridors to help support the businesses and the community through non-enforcement patrol. Um, Yes, uh, moving forward, we also, uh, in regards to quality of life and business and community support, are recommending a new agent of change policy. We see this policy in several cities um, that says any new development, such as a residential building or venue, should be responsible themselves as the agent of change in a neighborhood for their own soundproofing and for common sense designs that put multiple pane windows or putting bedrooms towards the back of apartments rather than on the streets um, in vibrant areas. So we recommend following in the footsteps of London and San Francisco and Melbourne, Melbourne Australia, um, and other cities to implement this agent of change policy to help avoid complaints and protect existing cultural and community uses. Um, another interesting thing is that we have uh, made the recommendation to increase Sunday sanitation services. Nightlife districts see their busiest activity and highest trash volumes on Friday and Saturday nights. Sanitation currently does not have um, does have significantly reduced levels of services on Sundays because work on those days qualifies for overtime pay and limits the department's flexibility to fully account for that activity. So we recommend that there's more additional street sweepers and trash bin pickups on Sunday to follow the busier Saturday nights. So on Sunday morning, when people are walking around, they're not saying, damn, Darn nightlife is so messy. <laughs> we want the next day to have almost no indication of the amazing time that people were having the night before. In our next bucket, we have uh, two, some new recommendations to help promote equity and safety and harm reduction. We want to see nightlife as a place where people can look out for each other and to promote policies that accept real human behavior with support and harm reduction approaches. In regards to race and gender and other discrimination issues, we have heard from many different communities across the city that they feel that there are more complaints and more enforcement against venues owned or frequented by people of color as well as members of the LGBTQ plus community and other marginalized groups. 
So we are recommending roundtables and bias training sessions to address these concerns regarding race, gender, sexuality, and other identities regarding enforcement. This was an issue that was of top priority pre-pandemic and is something that we are picking up right away now that we are beginning to see this pandemic behind us. In regards to safer spaces, many venues and communities are taking steps to enact safer space policies to prevent harassment and discrimination and to promote awareness around issues such as consent and discrimination. We are working with groups such as OutSmart to help bring those approaches to all New Yorkers that we've seen work in their own individual work and they've been doing incredible things that really we want to emulate and model citywide. So we recommend continuing to work with advocates to develop campaigns and bystander training to promote safer spaces, as well as to promote fairness and equity and access in talent booking, hiring, door policies, dress codes. These are things people in the nightlife industry have known are issues. And I think it's time we start addressing them in a more transparent and strategic way and to create better practices to help elevate equity in our nightlife spaces. Moving forward regarding harm reduction, I already mentioned the stigma associated with drug and alcohol use in nightlife venues that have historically resulted in policies that increase risk and enforcement rather than reduce and prevent harm. So we are extremely proud to continue our work with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene or DOHMH to take harm reduction approaches to these issues. First was the introduction of Narcan, overdose prevention, training, and narcotic testing, as well as now looking into remedies and new educational materials uh, to help again address the increasingly urgent need regarding the prevalence of fentanyl in cocaine and other drug uses that have been resulting in opioid overdoses, as well as other drug use. It's not just about fentanyl. We have to get real. And I think the uh, legalization of cannabis is also a very um, clear sign that this city uh, understands that we need to start addressing human behavior in a human way. Speaking of which, I'm very happy also to um, really address the issue around mental health in nightlife in a more meaningful way as well. Working in nightlife was always hard on our mental health before the pandemic. And it's been such a difficult year for everyone in this community. And we've heard extremely painful stories. And so in response, we are now working with our partners at the Office of Community Mental Health, as well as other organizations to help connect nightlife directly with mental health resources and services. And so you will see this flyer and hopefully you'll see it on our social campaigns and in our newsletters that on this Wednesday, uh, we will be hosting a forum on and a healing on collective trauma. And we're also going to be announcing six months of support groups um, on collective trauma dedicated to the nightlife industry, a resource guide on available uh, resources, as well as providing free casework to help you navigate free and affordable resources. And so I really encourage everyone not only to join, but to share this forum with everyone that you know Everyone's been affected by this. There is no shame in understanding the impacts of this pandemic in our lives. And in order to heal, we need to do so in a meaningful way and to do it together. And I invite you all to join us at three o'clock on Wednesday 
to, as we announce the Elevate Nightlife Mental Health Initiative. And then finally, our fourth bucket is how do we elevate and preserve nightlife culture moving forward? Nightlife is a big driving force behind our city's cultural identity, as well as our economic viability. And we want to establish new policies and programs to help support cultural spaces and New Yorkers who work and perform in them. So here are a few of the recommendations that we are making to help do that. Um, so first, we recommend temporary cultural event permits, which means we know that it can be cost prohibitive, really, to host an underground or DIY or independent event, which has led event organizers to operate underground and to take more risk because it's unaffordable and unattainable at times. So it maybe takes too long. So we're recommending reducing the time and the cost to host one off cultural events or series of small events through a process for a new process. And um, this is similar to a program that we've seen in Vancouver that created the arts events license where cultural event organizers for events under 250 patrons in certain zones of the city can submit their own drawings without architects, which are extremely expensive. That's just one idea and recommendation that we've seen work in other places that we recommend. Another is the conditional occupancy for DIY spaces. Uh, we are proposing allowing unlicensed DIY or underground spaces um, that host com artistic communities and events to come forward to the city without fear um, and to help support them into compliance. And this is being modeled after a safe occupancy program in Denver, where their planning and fire departments worked with DIY spaces on developing compliance plans, provided that there is no imminent fire or life safety hazards. Um, another issue that many people are, uh, you know, really excited about is the conversation that is happening and that we rec are recommending, which is reforming zoning to allow more dancing in New York City, um, which is really important. Uh, unfortunately, as many of us know, the zoning code, and may maybe actually many of us don't know, uh, that the zoning code still regulates dancing, which means that there are areas where the act of dancing is te technically not allowed because of the zoning. There is an effort to repeal, oh, I'm sorry, the effort to repeal the cabaret law was a huge first step for dancing, but we recommend finishing the job by reforming the zoning language and to focus more on the size and use of venues rather than the restriction of dancing itself. Another really interesting and exciting recommendation is the idea of a 24 hour use pilot program. Now, that might sound really wild to some people, considering New York has a 4 a.m. Life, um, hours and is among some of the latest in the country. But we've seen in other cities that allowing 24 hour use in specified districts, if implemented properly, can actually help people move and socialize at their own their own pace rather than having to get it all in before four o'clock in the morning and can actually help reduce conflicts and quality of life concerns by not having everyone rushing out and rushing in at the same time and having a more fluid in and out movement of crowds throughout these um, nightlife spaces. We have seen that this is very successful in Berlin that doesn't have any uh, curfew whatsoever, but also in Amsterdam. After being implemented there several, several years ago, um, new licensees that committed to hosting community programming in exchange for this allowance 
in certain areas has proved wildly successful for everyone, not just businesses, not just nightlifers who like to go out, but for the communities as well. And so we are recommending this as a pilot um, to identify areas where 24 hour use might be appropriate and to, again, help reduce quality of life impacts and bring after hours activities out of the shadows. Um, and we just have two more. So I will start by saying that there are many underused city assets for safe and compliant venues throughout New York. Uh, there are a lot of vacant or underutilized buildings that might not necessarily be appropriate for other uses such as housing or community facilities. So we're recommending that the city identify buildings and spaces, perhaps one in each borough, and invest in creating a safe and compliant space, almost a white box, if you will, that has all of the permits and compliance and safety measures in place, and to create affordable, accessible venues for cultural events, producers and promoters, uh, similar to what we've seen in Paris and Amsterdam and other cities. And then finally, some of you may have seen uh, with the announcement of this report last week or maybe the week before, um, the idea of creating a nightlife museum, a New York City nightlife museum. Um, you know, I really feel like this, the idea of, of a museum really sort of encapsulates everything that this office um, is meant to be and what it's about, which is elevating this industry as high culture, as important, as necessary, and part of our history. And so we really would love to be able to start exploring creating a nightlife museum that recognizes nightlife as high culture and to showcase everything that this that the nightlife industry has contributed to this city throughout time and in the future. And uh, would look forward to seeing where we can go with that. And um, I guess that concludes the presentation right now. We know that there's so many, so much more to do and that this three and a half years and this small office and this presentation really doesn't cover everything and all of the issues and concerns that nightlife and the community and industry have. But we think that it's uh, hopefully a good start. And we know that the pandemic in many ways was a distraction of all of this work, but in many ways it also helped us to focus and to remember uh, what we love so much about it, how much we appreciate it, and to really work extra hard to make sure that this industry is no longer vulnerable and more sustainable um, in the future moving forward. And I'm confident that this office that was created to be dedicated to this industry is and will continue to fulfill its purpose um, and to help us heal and grow and lead the world and to make sure that New York nightlife remains the greatest in the world. So thank you very much for uh, watching this presentation and for your interest. And if there are questions, uh, we can answer them now. And if not, um, I just encourage you all to read the report and to be involved in the office and follow the office because there's so much more work to be done. Thank you. Jose, do we have any questions? Jose, you are on mute and I cannot see you. Yep. <laughs> I do see some, it says, can you discuss plans regarding cannabis consumption lounges in aiding with the recovery? Um, I can't discuss it in too much detail because it's still really um, new and being developed by the state. Um, we know that much like the state liquor authority, what is it, the, Jose, the cannabis, unmute, I'm blanking. It's the cannabis control board. 
Yes. Which is there, not yet, it's in the process of being established. It is in the process of being established. It will be responsible uh, for setting the regulations. But I think to your point, um, there's no doubt that creating consumption lounges not only will help in the recovery of the city, but also will help with the really important work of decriminalizing human behavior um, and addressing the issues around inequity um, and the prevalence of the incarceration of black and brown people for the use of cannabis, which was intolerable and unjust. And um, I, I, I believe that, it, that the legalization of cannabis is exactly the right and necessary step to resolve that injustice, as well as to stabilize the industry, as well as to decriminalize human behavior. Um, can the new mayor's small business initiative assist with temp and quick SLA licenses? Um, well, I don't know if it is to assist with the temp SLA. It can assist. Um, I know that new legislation was just passed on a Senate level to allow for temporary liquor licensing permits, which up until a few weeks ago was only allowed in every other part of New York State and not New York City. And thanks to the incredible advocacy work of the Hospitality Alliance and other groups, um, temporary 30-day permits after community board approval is now allowed. And that's going to really help the industry get back on its feet because we know that there's been a up to six month wait for liquor licensing. And um, it's really prohibitive to getting New York back on its feet. And I'm so glad that this passed. And I'm sure that the, the new small business services will help at least to navigate to make sure you know how to do it. Um, regarding outdoor performances, uh, that's an interesting suggestion. Oh, okay. I'm reading a text message. So what does your office propose in regards to making it easier for small bars and restaurants to offer live music and comedy in their outdoor spaces during early hours of the evening without neighbor and police hassle? Um, well, you know, first of all, I'd say that the, um, the open culture program was created to help support outdoor culture in outdoor spaces. And um, I know that that's an important thing that uh, the city has supported throughout the pandemic and I think throughout the summer as well. And as long as the proper permits and processes are, are implemented, then there should be allowance to do so. I think, you know, when it comes to live music, performance, or any amplification of any kind, it's important to know when and where you're able to do it and when you can't. And when you are able to do it, I know that there's sound meters and DEP decibel readings, but venue operators, and I think the performers also need to use their internal decibel reader and try to assess how what is the impact that it's having on the community so that we can coexist in a balanced way where people and sound can happen outside, but in a way that's not disturbing, that doesn't also trigger complaint. And that's a balance that good operators can find, but if there's unreasonable and unfair and excessive complaints that are unsubstantiated, we're working on trying to, again, create com communication, compromise, and if necessary, consequence. Um, what will happen to you in the Office of Nightlife Board when a new mayor takes office in January? So it is, um, the Office of Nightlife will be here no matter what. This office was signed into law through legislation with the help of the advocacy groups like the Alliance and the Artist Coalition and the work of Council Member Rafael Espinal. And it is law, thanks to the mayor. Um, my, me and my team could potentially be reappointed and there's a possibility that we might not. It's at the pleasure of the new incoming mayor. 
We personally would very much like to stay. We feel there's a lot of unfinished business and the pandemic was something unforeseen and we would love to be part of the recovery of the industry. Um, but again, that would be, I guess, up to the new mayor and perhaps the work of the, the voice of the industry itself on what they might want. Um, regarding the nightlife advisory board, um, the, I'm gonna just pull this up. The nightlife advisory appointments are on a two year cycle. So with or without us, personally in this office. Um, there are nine appointments by the city council and five by the mayor's administration. And I believe that they were just re, uh, they were new appointments recently. And so the next cycle would be in the next two years. And that would be left up to the new mayor and the new city council. Um, last question. Uh, will there be support available for producers and promoters looking to open or expand their spaces um, and venues? I'm not sure I understand the question. I may have missed it, but will there be support available for producers and promoters looking to open and expand their spaces or venues? Um, I wish I had a little bit more clarity, but I think that together with this one-stop shop and with all of the grants and all of the loans and all of the small business um, support that's being created, I mean, listen, if New York nightlife and hospitality doesn't come back, New York doesn't come back. You will know New York is back when this industry is back on its feet. And so this office, this administration, are gonna work in the time that we have left and beyond to make sure that what you have and what you need is being addressed. And if you don't see it being addressed, then let us know. I've said this a lot um, over time, over the last three years, the greatest strength that this office has is the ability to say what we're hearing is. Right. So if you write us an email, if you reach out to us on social and say, I'm a promoter, what I would really love to see is this. This is a problem that I'm having. This is a solution I recommend. We take that ball and then we take it to the table and we take it where the decisions are made and where the conversations are being had. And that's how we get it done. This office is a reflection and a voice for you. So if you didn't see what you wanted to see in this report, or you want to see more, then just let us know. And we will do everything in our power to amplify that need and to get it done. And so I don't think I see any more questions. And with that said, thank you all so much for taking the time to sit here and listen to this summary of this report. Um, you can find it at nyc.gov slash nightlife. Please spread the word and join our Nightlife Mental Health Initiative and Forum on Wednesday at 3 p.m. And please reach out to us anytime. Uh, info at, no, nightlife at media.nyc.gov. You can reach out to us on our social, all of our handles. It's easy to reach us. Um, I wish you all the best as you continue to heal and recover and rebuild. And um, just grateful to be here to serve you as needed. And um, until we meet again, thank you so much. <laughs>